God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. One of the verses in the Bible that I think tends to be kind of underrated is the one we're going to talk about today, John 17, 17. We're going to be talking about what it means to be sanctified in the truth. What does the Bible say about that? What does it mean for us to be sanctified in the truth? This all starts with Jesus' prayer for his followers, for his disciples. He's wrapping up his ministry. It's close to the end. But as always, his focus is, is always on what he can do for others. There's certainly no more shining example of that than, than what we see in, in the life of Jesus himself. And he's looking, not just looking around, of course, at his present time, but he's looking ahead all the way through to us and beyond. He knows what the situation is going to be when he's not physically there with them anymore. He knows what it, would, what it would be for us. He knows what we need. And this is the conversation he has. In his prayer, he says, I have given them your word, starting off in verse 14. And as it says in the Net Bible, revealed your name to the men you gave me. We're going to use English standard for most of this. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So what we see right away is this notion of being set apart. You're not like all the other eggs in the basket, declared to be someone different, someone special. As a result, you're going to attract some attention, some unwanted attention, some negative attention. This doesn't fit in with what the rest of the world wants. This doesn't fit in with the way they want to live. It doesn't fit in with being self-indulgent. It doesn't fit in with just going along with every kind of evil there is because you like it or it's fun or it's easier. So what Jesus knows is there's going to be a need for some protection. There's going to be a need to try to make it easier for those who call themselves Christian, to hold on, to stay faithful. So what's being requested here is that we be sanctified in the truth. The word of God is truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Back in the Old Testament, we see this in Psalm 119. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. So when we talk about sanctification in the Greek here, Hagia son from Hagios to make holy, that is to purify or to consecrate or to venerate. So this is something or someone special. In Ezekiel, it talks about part of the role of the priests. One of the important things that they were to do was to teach the people the difference between the holy and the common. Show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. This slide is black and white intentionally. There are things that are indeed black and white. Some things are right. Some things are wrong. That's one of the biggest problems with people, right? They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that there's right and there's wrong. It's like, well, you know, my situation is different. Well, you know, what... Uh, you can have your reality, but I've got mine. Well, there are things that are objectively true and objectively false. There are things that are wrong, and there are things that are right. So, 
to follow the path, the correct path. What John 17, 17 says, a few different versions here, says, set them apart in the truth, your word is truth. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Here's what's interesting when you look at these three. Set them apart, make them holy, sanctify them. This is Jesus' prayer for them and for us. And for those and for whoever follows us that believes in Christ. So there's that whole idea of just like there were certain things in the temple that were declared to be holy, declared to be special. There were certain people, right, declared to be holy. So this whole idea is that this is to apply to us. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says, Sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. Now there's a few things going on here that we're going to look at individually for a second, that there's a work that God does. And there's a work that God continues to do. And then eventually there's a, this work will be completed. So a few different angles, a few different ways we can kind of look into sanctification a little bit. A few terms you might find handy. Positional sanctification is possessed by every believer from the moment of their conversion. When you're declared part of God's family, you're declared special, you're declared to be holy. Have you completely reached that yet? Well, no, but there is a position. It says here in First Peter, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. God says, you are mine that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, recognizing what was done, that special designation, and proclaiming it. See this in 2 Corinthians 5 as well. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Your life is not the same any longer from that moment. Yet we know that we're not done. That happens, right? Certainly, some people might believe that, but it's certainly not correct. There's an ongoing process, which moves us to the next thing. Progressive sanctification, which is the daily growth in grace, more and more set apart for God's use. Back to Second Corinthians chapter 3 this time. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Obviously, something that's got to continue. We look at our own lives, and we think about how far along we are in the path to holiness. And we go, well, <laughs> some days it feels like we're a little farther along than others, right? So this is certainly ongoing. It's going to be a continuing process as long as we're walking around. There will be a point, however, when this is completed referred to as ultimate sanctification, fully and completely set apart to God in heaven. If you look at what First John has to say, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is, with our glorified bodies, free of all suffering, free of all imperfection, freed of sin once and for all, with God forever. But it's going to be a while to get there. Strong's Concordance says, Sanctify is to purify internally by reformation of soul. Kind of made me think of uh, something I have in my cellar. It looks pretty much like this. Sometimes if you have problems with your drinking water, you know, you might have water from the city and it might be uh, all filtered out and controlled and everything, but if, like us, you have well water, it can, be, it can vary a bit. What these uh, items are designed to do is run the water through it so that it comes out in a better form, whether it's filtering out impurities or whatever. In our case, the water was really hard. 
those of you who have ever experienced hot water, you'll know your fixtures start turning a little greenish, you know, you know, the water's way too hard. And what this does is the process when the water comes through hard, comes out softer. This is the goal with our hearts, right? They start off hard, but we want them to be softened. Sometimes, well, sometimes I should say all the time, we, we, we know that we don't instantly have perfect hearts. This is going to take a while. And we're, we're kind of resistant sometimes to this softening process, aren't we? In Romans 12, it says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God. Here's that, that holy, that, that designation, special again, right? Which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, that's the point, right? That transformation by the renewal of your mind requires a yielding. We're all familiar. We've all seen that yield sign out in traffic that we see everybody ignore and just go blazing through. It just tells you to give way, to soften up a bit. If someone's coming, let them go. Give them the right of way. Give Jesus the right of way in your life. Give the word of God the right of way in your life. Yield to that so that you don't resist this process of being transformed by the renewal of your mind. It's kind of funny. You wouldn't think that, you see, seasoned Christians sometimes have a problem doing this because they're still kind of stubborn. They want to do things their own way. We all have to remember that, that yielding is a constant thing. We always want to do that. Let's shift back to those three versions from the Net, the New Living, and the Old King James. Our key verse, it says, set them apart in the truth. Make them holy by your truth. Sanctify them through your truth. So when we talk about what the Bible is capable of doing, that classic verse that we're all, all familiar with from Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing even to the point of dividing soul from spirit and joints from marrow. It is able to judge the desires and thoughts of the heart. That's the process that this is talking about. This isn't just about being awakened to the truth of God and being saved, it's that process of sanctif sanctification that we all need to go through and that we need to continue along on that path, that yielding that we continue to, to need to do as time goes on. A great Bible commentator, one of my favorites, John Gill said, talking about the truth of God, he said, he, Christ, being the author, preacher, and sum and substance of it, of what? Of the truth. And because the spirit of truth has dictated it, leads into it, qualifies men to preach it, and makes it effectual, and because it contains all truth necessary to salvation. Not only do we have this, but we're given the ability to understand it. Right? You see folks who look at the Bible and go, oh, you've got to be kidding me. This dusty old book written so many years ago, and, you know, the, this it doesn't make any sense in today's world. Well, they haven't been given that. They're not part of that process of sanctification that allows us to understand the Bible better and better. The more time I spend with it, the more sense it makes. The more time I spend with it, the more is revealed to me. Verses that I've read a million times over and over again, suddenly one day I'm like, I never thought of that before. So then usually I come up here and tell you that because <laughs> I don't know if you've thought of that before, so I want to make sure you know. Now, as I said earlier, now we're down to verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Those who will hear about it. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Not only for those who are present with him, but all the way through history for us too. And by the way, this can be any of you, any conversation, any time. Nobody's got to be ordained to share the word of God. You don't have to be standing up here. You don't have to be on TV. You don't have to be any kind of an author and have half a dozen books out to tell people about God. What you do is tell people what God has done for you. Who is God to you? That's the question. What's the big deal? Why are you always talking about God? What's the, the deal with that? 
we should at least be able to tell someone that. Why are you different now? Because of the presence of Jesus in your life. Because that, that curtain's been pulled aside for you. What's different? Who are you now? What are you about? What does God mean to you? You don't have to be a theological expert. Now, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. Again, talking about us today, this is a prayer for us to be united in purpose. Why are we here? Are we here to serve ourselves? Are we here to just get what we can get? Are we here to scam our way through life? Are we here to just focus on, on ourselves, just, you know, going from day to day? Or do we have a greater purpose that ironically will help make all this easier to handle, by the way, and will help other people on their road? Our purpose is to serve God. Our purpose is to, to do whatever we can to live for him. It's, it's simple enough. We're, everybody's got a lot of catchphrases about um, what we're here and what Christians are supposed to do. God tells us clearly what we're supposed to do. We're here to serve him. We're here to serve him through the service of others. We're here to spread the good news of Christ. There's nothing complicated here, right? And we, we do that if we're united in heart. Do we truly feel this way about God? God loves us so much. We can't begin to approach that kind of love, but we should certainly be able to appreciate it and express it as best we can. We talk about sharing the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ. This is, this is what we're all about. We're all about him, and we're all family. We should be all about helping each other along this path as well, united in community. You notice that Jesus made that, that comparison to be one and to be in us as we, as he, he, he wants us to be as united as possible. He looks at the unity of the Trinity and he, and he puts us right alongside that. that. That's how strong he wants us to feel that we're family, that we belong together and that we need to work together for him. Here in Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, it says, I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord, Paul speaking, of course, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Certainly he's telling us we need to get along, but doesn't it go way beyond that? As a prisoner for the Lord, he's certainly committed there is that special designation, that special calling of this holy priesthood of ours. It requires humility. It requires gentleness, kindness, love, patience, especially with each other. And we do get under each other's skin now and then. Right? I get that. You know, it's always going to happen. But bearing with each other, ultimately finding a way to stay together, finding a way to get past some of these little difficulties. And here's the important part. It doesn't say just put up with each other because, hey, you know, you're stuck with each other and that's how it is. You can just suffer along and get over it. No, it says eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We should be excited about that. I have a family that shares this heart for God. How special is that? There's all kinds of people running around. There's plenty of people that can call each other family. Put them together at Thanksgiving and see what happens. <laughs> this is special. This goes beyond our, our normal concept of family, doesn't it? We're eager to maintain that. You know, we should be, Rev talked about how important it is for, for us to be together here. And it's not just, well, I guess I better go. It's like, ooh, 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 it's Sunday. It's church time. Time to go to church. Let's go. There are times when we can't be here, we're sick, we're away, the things are going on, you know, that's all understandable. But by and large, our attitude should be that we're glad to be here, and we can't wait to get here on a Sunday morning. This was the coolest part of this, and this is another one of those things that, as we're reading by, I think sometimes we miss it. Why is all this unity so important? Why is it important that we 
live so intently for God and we do it together. Jesus says it's so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Why does Jesus pray for this? Why does it matter how we are? Why does it matter what we do or what we say or how well we get along? He doesn't need us to tell the world about himself, right? But he chooses to use us to tell the world about himself. So if we have no credibility, if the second you open your mouth, you get talked to the hand because they know what you're really like, yikes. Now, I want to be clear about one thing. We have nothing to do with the act of salvation. That is entirely a work of God. I always get nervous when people say, I, oh, I, I had the privilege of leading, leading so-and-so to Christ. I'm like, you didn't lead anybody anywhere. No one comes to me until the Father draws him. That's John 6, 44, if you want to look that up. We don't do that. We get used in the process. We are blessed. We are honored and fortunate enough to be there when this happens, but we're not doing it. The point is, if I live like an idiot and call myself Christian and I don't have any credibility with anybody, someone who God wants, he's going to have them. But that means I won't be there for that. It means I'll miss that. So that's a missed opportunity. That's a time I could have served God and I didn't because I wasn't serving God generally. God says, you're not ready for me to use right now. I might have something else for you to do later, but right now I'm going to use someone else for this because... You're blowing it. Second Corinthians 3 says, speaking about Paul and company, he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by who? By all. Anytime, anywhere. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Let's look at that again. You show that you are a letter from Christ. Your example, your lives, testify to what we've taught you. You're a letter from Christ. Do we feel like we're a letter from Christ that we want people to read? written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So thinking about this, I said, you know, what we need to do, we need to be a better letter. That's what we need to strive for every day. Be a better letter. I like this so much, I put it on my fridge. I printed it out. My wife said, what is that? And I said, I'll tell you Sunday. If for no other reason, here's a reason, 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, or maybe what he has not done. You know, in um, the Revelation, it talks about how the Lord will wipe every tear away from, from our eyes. And most commonly, people interpret that to say, it's, it'll be because suffering will be over. We won't have to uh, have our physical ailments anymore. We won't have uh, these heartbreaking events in our lives anymore. And we won't struggle with sin anymore. And all that's true. But I also think it talks about this. I think there are going to be a few tears shed when we realize, when we get to look back and see all the times we could have served Christ, we could have lived for him, but we didn't because we were too busy living for ourselves. And I think that's going to account for a few of those tears. Classic commentator Matthew Henry said, A Christian's life should be devoted to Christ. Alas, how many show the worthlessness of their professed faith and love by living to themselves and to the world. Remember, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making his plea through us. Like I said, he doesn't need us to do that. But what a privilege and what an honor it is that he uses us for that very reason. Whether it's through just our example itself, whether it's through what we say to others, we're the message, we're the email, we're, we're the letter, we're the postcard, whatever you want to call it. 
So when John 13, 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples, it should be obvious. It should stand out. People should just be impressed. The bottom line is the body of Christ needs to be all in. This is not something you can do halfway and expect any kind of results. The thing about churches, the, the common concept, we always talk about how churches should be kind of like a spiritual hospital. You've been knocked around by the world. You've been knocked around by the devil. You've pretty, pretty much had it. And you come in the door and, oh, thank God there's some healing and some refreshment here, right? But I don't think it should stop there. I think just saying the church should be a hospital is a little bit inadequate. I refer over to the Great Commission here for a second, Matthew 28. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this line right here, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Not just telling them about it, but showing them how to do it. I think churches should be more like teaching hospitals. We're here not just to be disciples. We're here to make disciples. We're here to show people what that means. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Our guidebook is the word of God. Your word is a lamp to walk by and a light to illumine my path. This is our guide to making disciples. It's the handbook. It's the word of God. Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Nothing could be plainer. If this is not what you're doing, you're going about it the wrong way. I think this is one of the most plainly spoken verses in the Bible. I don't know how you could make it any clearer than this. So what is trust? Trust is, to slap a personal definition on this, it's a choice to act in accordance with our faith. We act on what we believe because we trust in what we've heard. When you're sitting in the doctor's office, hopefully this is someone whose opinion you value, whose abilities you trust. If this guy says you've got Rocky Mountain spotted fever or I don't know, whatever, you figure he probably knows what he's talking about. As a result, he's going to give you advice. He's going to give you instructions. And then the question is going to be, what are you going to do about it? He writes your prescription. He says, take this X number of times a day. In two weeks, you'll be fit as a fiddle. Well, you have a decision to make at this point, right? Do you believe that? Or do you think he has no idea what he's talking about? Each day we have to make decisions like this. And each day we, have to, we are confronted by something that God says, and we have to decide if we really believe it or not. If you believe what the doctor says, you'll go to the pharmacy. And he'll say, here you go, I need my pills. And you'll start taking them, won't you? And hopefully <laughs> in a couple of weeks you'll be feeling a lot better. The best part of this is we have a, it's not just, I hope it'll be okay. We have guarantees from God. We know that what he says is true. All we have to do is to decide to accept it and act on it. Charles Spurgeon said, Christ's prayer is sanctify them through thy truth. The more truth you believe, the more sanctified you will be. It's not complicated. The operation of truth upon the mind is to separate a man from the world unto the service of God. Just in proportion as truth is given up, worldliness and frivolity are sure to prevail. What do you want your life to be like? Make that decision to believe what God says. Trust in him and act on it. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He says, I'm not having that. You're not going to put one over on me. I'm not going to listen to all that. I know what's true, and I know where to find it. And it keeps me going, and I'm going to be looking at that day and night any way you can. I, I personally do enjoy the feel of just holding the Bible in my hands, but I've got it on my phone too, 
that's the best way that I find to do this. Uh, follow like a, I always had trouble with those daily reading programs, and I've got one on my phone that tells me how far I am. It encourages me. You got know, what percentage I've read already. Kind of nudges you along a little bit. You know, tells you where you are. I say, yep, you succeeded today, and and here's what you're going to be doing tomorrow. Any way you can to get yourself in there as as often as possible, whatever works, do it. Because what comes out of this is what everybody wants, but they try to go through all kinds of crazy methods and ways to find it. But what they're looking for, you ask anybody, they're looking for joy. They're looking for peace. They're looking for fulfillment. The pure, unadulterated joy you see on the face of this child in the picture, that's what we should be experiencing when we look at God. The peace, knowing that we'll be with him one day, knowing that he'll never leave us on our own. The fulfillment of having something substantial. I don't know about you, but when I hit midlife, around the time that everybody starts to have their uh, midlife crisis kind of thing, Fortunately for me, that was right around the time I got saved, back in 2005. And then I knew where fulfillment really came from. I knew that none of this other stuff really even mattered. What counts is that I belong to God now. So what counts is that I can be part of that process. I can yield to him and I can be sanctified in the truth. I've got something to live for. I've got someone to live for. I don't have to worry anymore. That's how it's got to feel to be sanctified in the truth. Brick after brick, God is building His temple. Brick after brick, He is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and His people as the stones, He is building a place He 